All right. So this room has given me a bit of an issue with all this stuff. So if the audio doesn't work, sorry, I think it should. And I'm super afraid to do double audio. That's how things get bad. But think of the next two lectures probably as like we're going to try and introduce you to as many of these as we can briefly, and then it'll be okay. Okay. Lymph. I should make that red text. Oops. Lymph is a network of your white blood cell kind of fluid. And as you can tell, it kind of follows a similar pattern as your arteries, veins, etc. The reason there's a starfish there is that's the beginning where we saw lymph for the first time. Early tax, uh, taxonomists were poking at animals all the time. And if you poke a starfish and like puncture it, the area becomes inflamed and white stuff will start to kind of like flood towards that area. That is lymph swelling, that is inflammation. With lymph, today we're going to see just at least meet some of your major organs, the spleen, the thymus, those are the two major ones. Tonsils are kind of involved, they do some immune modulation type stuff. But sort of the secondary articles are going to be lymph nodes, which populate kind of all over the place. Think of this as a network of country, for example. You have to go all over the place, fight infection wherever you might see it, right? You need to have highways for that. Everything that you produce in the spleen and thymus does eventually have to find its way wherever you are getting hit. So, immunology was a, is a long road. The basics, so everybody's heard the stories. Back in the old days, doctors were actually regard, regarded sort of more like butchers, like a dirty job. And you were a better doctor the more blood you had on your coat, live blood. Yeah, so it's no wonder that giving birth in a hospital pre-1800s at least, you're actually way worse off than giving birth at home. Because the doctor would show up from one birth, gloves, and just start going. Kind of not what you want. So one of the first guys, Semmelweis in Germany, was like, we should maybe wash our hands off. Everybody just, they fired him, they hated him. They're like, you idiot. It was kind of sad. <laughs> You'll find that 10 years is about the number that when you find something out, it takes everybody to kind of take up 10 years to get on board, I would, I would say. So, as far as what the innate response begins, skin is the first thing. You have literal barriers. Stuff can't get in. Your skin is one of your best immune organs. Innate response, just the Latin in it as well. Think innate, think instinct. Every one of us is born with the same basic components of what we'll probably see today. I do not believe we'll get to adaptive BNT cell advanced stuff today in these 50 minutes. The key here is that immediately these things start working. They're very fast what they do. So who's ever got, for example, a cut on their finger and like nothing came of it, right? A lot of the time, the tools that we'll see today, they just nuked everything and they moved on. It was okay. Unlike what we'll see later, this is never going to develop a like memory response. We'll never be immune again based on this system. If you encounter the same bacteria or virus again, it may get killed in the same way. That's fine. But the natural thing that's happening is that on some of these cells, they have very specific little receptors that find bacteria, that find viruses. And K cells are a very good example of that. We'll meet a couple of these guys. Basically, everything in here comes ready to go when you're born genetically. You don't have to change anything about these very good at what they do. So, first line of defense, like I said, skin, a little more detailed look here. As you can tell, your lymph nodes are under your skin, intertwined with your arteries because, again, they have to follow the same mass system of going to, like, fight something. If, for example, you would puncture right here, that blue doesn't look very good, you would puncture, like, right here really bad, and all that lymph would have to eventually start to kind of creep up and start feeding cells into that puncture wound to just kill everything that came with it. Okay. 
and hence why surgery to this day is dangerous. Anytime you break that barrier, you risk your biggest defense being completely opened up. Now, equally, one of the interesting things, and this isn't a microbiology class, but if, we, if we're talking about things that naturally defend against enemies, your skin comes with sort of antimicrobial peptides, but it also comes with your skin bacteria. Everybody here, you've got bacteria running around your skin, and it's probably bacteria that evolved with humans for all these millions of years. Our defenses don't actually kill them because they take up the room that infection would. Basically think that Bacteria that happen to be skin, human, kind of microbiome type stuff, they want to live. They actually secrete poisons that kill other bacteria that try and land on you because you're their environment, you're their home. The word commensal is helpful here too. Commensal in ecology is going to mean it's kind of there for its own benefit. It doesn't harm you though. You could probably argue that a lot of these bacteria are mutualistic, that they kind of defend us, take up room from really bad stuff. And they also get their home. That's not bad. Now, as far as how your cells are designed, have a lot of regulation and epithelial cells, tight junctions. You do not have gaps between your skin cells and cells that pathogen can just willingly go right through. A lot of the borders pretty well sealed as far as that. Now, when you don't have physical barriers, we start to rely on a kind of a higher level of chemical barriers. A lot of acidic, sort of degrading style enzyme type stuff, right? So, your mouth is a cavity that is exposed, right? Your mouth is full of acidic, nasty, antimicrobial stuff that prevents a lot of nasty stuff from ever taking hold, basically. All these little pieces, these are natural, they come with you, the environment itself, kind of says, even though this is an opening, this is not a friendly place to be for any pathogen. So a lot of your genes are small, just inhibitory genes that make kind of like a curly Q protein like this. And in this case, they're made of amino acids that are positive, a lot of them, because naturally bacteria are actually charged negative because they're cell wall. Because you have that interaction right here, a lot of antimicrobial genes that you just produce all the time will just soak bacteria the minute they show up. What they end up doing is they'll grab the bacteria and just rip it to pieces, and that's that. So despite every time you eat food, every time you bite your nails, anything like that, that's why you don't get constantly sick from that. I have a lot of these just natural defenses, and we haven't even gotten into the cells yet. Not all of these are just rippers, like at the top. Some of these will, if they bind to their target, they may actually recruit bigger guns. They may actually begin to initiate issues inside the cells, right here. I'll say kill outside, kill inside. Recruits the big one right here. And the last thing these little peptides can do, and remember, these are just naturally occurring genes, just strings of protein that happen to be really good at this, can kill biofilms. So biofilms are basically a gel that bacteria spit out, and they can move really nicely and easily. Disrupting that is key when pathogen gets really aggressive, because it makes things very easy for bacteria to exist and like kind of overwhelm you when they have biofilm. Now it needs to be their biofilm. Your microbiome in your mouth and stuff, so those of you in pre-dental, this is like a big deal. Naturally is a biofilm that only works on the nice bacteria in your mouth. Invading bacteria have to like get a foothold and start kind of terraforming an area. That's why things kind of roll really badly once that happens. That's why antibiotics kind of come in here. But these little peptides are a good way to ensure that that does that foothold does not happen. So as far as meeting cells, this is red, but it's kind of red for later. We'll, we'll definitely see this. So, like we kind of talked about before, most of your white blood cells can come from a sort of stem cell. These are in your bone marrow. And at any point, they can be recruited to say, like I said last time, you need more B cells. Let's go. You 
you need more neutrophils, let's do that. You have a lot of options here. Characters that we'll all sort of meet today, I'd say, are NK cells, monocytes, basophils, neutrophils. You may see these guys, and we may talk a little bit about mast cells. Consider B and T cells not in the innate immune system. They are not rapid response. We'll see what the adaptive looks like later. And you can also notice this where red blood cells come from, too. But kind of fun that it's all interconnected. Okay. So, blue tech, I think this is our first blue text. Um, this is where what we call immunology, what we call our immune system, was the divergence point here. Every animal besides hagfishes, lampreys, the gross. Everything from that point in animal evolution has the same semi-pattern to what our immunology looks like. Mammals, it's even more similar. That's why this class, yeah, I probably, sometimes I'm gonna have a bigger focus on humans. But the good news is you can apply this so long as you don't study lampreys and hagfish and other ugly things. So it could be all right. Sorry, they are really nasty though, it terrifies me. The ocean itself also is just terrifying. I don't, I don't know why anybody gets there. All right, so a non-cell natural defense, are one of our first ones. So these are genes again, but they are a little more specific than the little peptides that just interfere. It's something called complement. Complement has its own lecture coming up, but I want to give you the basic idea. What happens is you start with C1 and you go through basically C9. C1 is a complement that will bind nicely to a lot of bacteria, virus particles. They naturally just show up with the tools to do that. So again, we're still in innate territory where these receptors and these amino acids are very well built to bind specifically to cell walls. What C1 can do is coordinate with antibodies. We'll meet them in a second. That's why complement's kind of hard to show is that it involves some of the later stuff too. It's a natural tool to begin that binding process. Binding process initiates step number two. So that's step number one. Step number two is that complement one will activate complement four and complement two. That creates something called C3. C3 is two genes put together. That's the only, all this cascade is not gonna happen unless you detect a big amount of bad guys. So, for the basic intro meeting, what complement eventually does is sort of go off in a massive network that initiates inflammation to begin, so just like redness, swelling, that kind of general stuff. But eventually it will build, recruit, build, recruit until you get this gigantic membrane attack complex. It's huge. Complement eventually build into this like massive like drill. Components all kind of come together like, I don't know, like Legos basically, and form this drill on the on a bacteria, punch holes in it, big guys. So, kind of fun, and they're really vicious. Hence my inclusion of this scene when you think of the vibe of what complement look like when they see stuff. Still an excellent scene, one of my favorites in the entire movie, and or all Pixar type movies. <laughs> I like sequels too, I think they're funny. And I was so horrified that they were just so mischaracterized. <laughs> well, now they're perfect, but whatever. That's what complement are like. They're like, this, this, kill, kill, kill. The video that I have on the link to the syllabus from Kurtzagat, it's, it's really fun to watch. That's linked up for when we do the full thing on complement, though. All right, time to meet some actual cell components, granulocytes. The name implies their role. They secrete granules. These granules are filled with poison. Poison against pathogens. So next, I think Wednesday, yeah, we'll actually do the microscopes for this. We'll actually get to see blood cells and real ones. So if you've taken fizz before, those are the fake slides. We're gonna actually look at your guys' blood. I'm also gonna bring some of my B cells for research, and I just want to stain them too and see what they look like, see if they're awkward looking. So every one of these comes equipped with the tools to kill. So think of these kind of as like kind of kill on site. They see their target, they will start going. Neutrophils, in a lot of cases, they are the first line of defense at bacteria. Bacteria is detected and the signals arise and say, okay, we are getting invaded by bacteria. 
neutrophils will show up. See those little dots in there? We'll begin to release those. Those are filled with poison. And if there is a bacteria cell kind of like running around right here, that poison will just shred it to pieces. Everything spills out, bacteria dies. I'd say mast cells are, this is where histamine comes from. These, this thing right here. Histamine is sort of a, it's more of a recruiter. Histamine rallies up the other two cells in this picture. The mast cells get to a site and they say, okay, something's bad, come get the actual killer ones. Histamine releases, and histamine a lot of the time is going to get you these two. It's gonna get you a basophils, and it's gonna get you eosinophils. So basophils and eosinophils have a very, very similar role. If it helps you to think of them as basically the same thing, I don't mind that. They again have the little granules that they can release and they kill their targets. Okay, let's slide up here. Yeah, I do. So neutrophils, everybody in this room, we still use quite a bit. Whenever you get a cut, anything, anytime there is a big invasion of bacteria, and remember, on the tip of your finger, there are about 10 million bacteria. So at any point that you rip that epidermis open, you're getting a lot. Basophils and eosinophils and mast cells we don't use as often anymore. And it's because humans don't have the same war with parasites that we used to. Nobody in this room probably have, is like infected with multicellular eukaryotes, right? With worms, things like that. That's what these are meant to kill. I didn't pull. I have a gift. So basophils and eosinophils have one job, and that is to kill massive parasites. Now, through a lot of public health interventions, we've eliminated a lot of parasites in the human population. We still have the tools to kill them on site whenever. There we go. Play, yeah. Okay. So three things are happening in this. God, okay, sorry. Some the angle on here. There we go. Three things are happening here. First, a signal gets right before they all attack. That is histamine sending out and saying, oh my God, kill this. And see the response once histamine is fed to the basophils and the eosinophils, what happens? They all converge at that spot and they start releasing that poison. The poison is so great that they can take down something a hundred times their size. In today's age, since we don't have parasites, but we have plenty of parasite hunters, typically this is where you hear the word antihistamine the word allergy. These cells that are perfectly equipped to kill parasites don't really have a tool, they don't have anything to fight anymore. A lot of time plant pollen, which is also eukaryotic, will set them off and they'll go into a rage. That's why you get really bad allergies or some autoimmune stuff sometimes. So, pretty sweet though, huh? Kind of terrifying. But power exists in all of them. Just because our immune system doesn't know what century it's been born in doesn't mean it doesn't have all these tools active and ready to go. So these are the most common cells that we'll see on Wednesday. So it's a good intro to actually see them in the microscope here, but I'll, I'll like poster for them too. All right, sweet. Yeah, like I said, neutrophils are much more bacteria heavy. This little image does, I think, a pretty good job of showcasing how many bacteria arrive when you cut your finger or something and how good they are and actually destroying everything in the area. So when they're in here, they're gonna start secreting that poison, the, gran the little granulocytes, and basically just kind of erase the area. Now, this is why, why do you think inflammation hurts so bad, right? Like if you have a pretty, like, a pretty moderate cut, it's like, wow, that hurts to touch. Because your neutrophils are indiscriminate about who they're killing, you just need to kill the entire area. Kind of one of those scorched earth type of mechanisms of your body. Now, the good news is that neutrophils, after they run out of signals from the thing saying, oh, there's bacteria here, they actually have a natural death process that eliminates them. So you stop nuking everything. Everything's all right. Again, they have a natural mechanism to die, a natural like clock on them. Oh, two hours, I'm sorry. So if 
they don't have the cells telling them like, oh no, or compliments saying or signals saying, okay, we're still in danger, they will just go away. So if they didn't go away, they are the source of sometimes when your immune system kills patients, for example. So future pills are pretty pretty good things. Next slide. All right. We're not quite halfway through, so no dog photos yet. This one's a little more specific. Natural killer cells. They're about as cool as they sound, honestly. They're pretty good at what they do. Natural killer cells have <coughs> receptors on them. A collection that we'll meet in a sec here. And naturally, their opening on the receptors naturally goes against structures on bacteria, viruses. That is the most stupid looking virus I've ever thought of. Okay, there we go. And give that one more hexagon try. Natural killer cells come equipped with genes that recognize immediately these things right here. None of those things occur in humans. You do not have, you do not have free floating RNA. You should not have circular DNA. All the little like movement stuff of bacteria, flagella, cilia, that's unnatural. You should never have single stranded DNA and none of your cells are made of cell walls. Natural killer cells are just basically like this big Swiss army knife of receptors. And if they see one of their targets, they'll just go nuts and start secreting poison. The reason natural killers, I kind of brought them out is they're a little, they're a little more specific, right? We're not in adaptive, we're not evolving response. This is basically just an arms race of evolution across hundreds of millions of years that says if this is in your body, and that's their role. So I think this is red, but it's kind of just what we've been talking about. This right here is complement, for example, attacking. Complement not only can drill holes in bad stuff, it can also lead it's a uh, target to get eaten by other things. Here is more of the path of an NK cell. NK cell have, like I said, they have sort of a lock and key on the most common type of issues. So if they start seeing, for example, in this cell, the cell starts expressing these kind of nasty, weird receptors on its surface because it's kind of crying out for help because it is infected with a virus, which is a natural mechanism we will get to see. But your cells do start to say, like, please, like, I'm, I'm blow me up because I've, I've been infected. This is bad. And K cells can see that and immediately blow that cell up. So, what these receptors are called toll like receptors. I believe this is posted, so it's mainly big idea again, just that. There are certain things in the human body that don't exist naturally. You have receptors that when those things exist, they activate natural killer cells. We find again, this is one of our one of our fun times where names in immunology can be kind of all over the place. Toll comes from your favorite thing, the fly, right? Everybody loves 211. We found that out. Come on, I, I really like the fly. That one. They're kind of fun. Um, that fly has a fungus infection on it. See that? That fly is a mutant for a gene that was called toll. Fungi are one of the things on here, again, fungi cell walls, that naturally get killed off by your natural killer cells. So a fly without some of these toll genes was susceptible to fungal infection. That's where the name comes from. All these little things. Bacteria, 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 virus or bacteria, and parasite, bacteria, virus. All these things that, if they hit their target, the next slide is red text, you don't need to know the gene names, but if they hit their target, go here first, they will trigger a massive cascade down. So if one of these binds LPS, the component of bacteria, 
the receptors will start to combine, hit a modulatory receptor inside the cell of another gene, and it will start to cascade like kind of an avalanche, basically. It tells that cell, okay, it's time to kill. Get all your poison out. Let's go. You can tell it takes a few steps. But the response is built to be quite fast. Everything in here will eventually say, okay, activate here, activate this gene, activate here, activate here. What that will ultimately do is activate something called a transcription factor. Those of you who have having to let it know what I'm talking about, this is just a gene that activates lots of other genes. One of the most powerful transcription factors in all of immunology is something called NF kappa B. It will go and it will activate hundreds of genes. That hundred gene response will be very instrumental in making sure that whatever you just encountered gets completely erased. And as you can tell, lots of other genes, even besides that of kappa B targets, will get activated. Notice here's a little border kind of designating where the nucleus is and where the cytoplasm is, too, showing that these genes are off normally, only when they're given that signal, they'll kind of turn on and go crazy. Okay, last one. Yeah. Last piece, and then we'll take a little break. Toll like receptors can face outside the cell or threats outside the cell. Typically, that's bacteria. Bacteria is usually an outside the cell infection. And some of your toll receptors face inside the cell. That is a virus. They are focused on killing viral targets. They will initiate the same killing process if they find their target, no matter what. Good first intro to how, even though these are very nonspecific, so all of us have these genes. All of us express these genes pretty normally. Nothing really changes. These are just kind of foot soldiers. They're very good at what they do. Okay, we're going to take about a minute break. We'll, I think we're going to be done with the immune innate system, maybe in a sec here. Yeah. <laughs> 
All right. So, a couple more innate features of the body's immune system. Inflammation is more local. That's where it's like, ouch, that hurts right there. Inflammation can also sometimes not be felt if it's more of an internal battle that whatever's happening. That inflammation is typically the recruitment of some of the cells we've seen today. That's why they get all mad. Neutrophils start killing everything. That's why it hurts. You are killing some of your cells to sacrifice for the greater good. Realistically, you really do. We'll see in a bit. If one bacteria from that cut got in the artery, it's a, that's the beginning of sepsis. And that's something in medicine that we're not very good at treating a lot of the time. Now, fever is the more, it's still nonspecific, but it is a bigger duty response, right? You get a cut, it's like, ouch, that's inflamed. You get a cut, you start getting fever. That's, that's bad, or that's worse than it looks like. Fever is the entire, what we call a pyrogenic response. Fire starter, that's why the Latin was pyrogenic. Patients in old medicine would come in, just burning up. Nobody knew what to do. Because again, we didn't even know what started fevers back then. Worst thing that we'll learn in this class is sometimes fevers start for reasons that aren't even to attack a pathogen. We get to that point. Typically, fevers don't start from one thing, but a lot of the time, fever responses can be initiated by TLRs. If they encounter bacteria, and there's a lot of it, they can begin that pyrogenic response, which again, the red text doesn't indicate that I want you to know all those genes, but I do want you to know that there's a bit of an avalanche towards that activation. That avalanche ends with something we call cytokines. Interleukins, or the IL. Cytokines are small little protein signals, they're genes, that are messengers that spread throughout the body, and they are sort of the mass-like informants that something is really, really wrong. Those have a very big connection with your brain, not just your body. Brain knows to receive fever signals. And it's sort of one of the initial connections between the brain and the immune system. Other funny thing about the immune system here, and this is sort of green text, but why do you feel so tired when you're sick? Those cytokines, part of their role in the brain is to kind of shut you down and make you go to sleep. Because the less energy you spend on moving around, running around, things like that, the more energy and metabolism you're going to use on your immune system. Yeah, speaking of metabolism, you guys know the whole Krebs cycle, right? That's on the test. I've had too many of you to pull that joke off anymore, though. <laughs> Sorry. I always try and scare everybody. I always have like a thing of the Krebs, and, I'm, and they're like, what? That again? It's pretty terrifying. I, yeah. But a good lesson with this is your immune system is an energy like hound, just like your brain. All this takes effort. All this takes, you know, glucose, sugar, energy, mitochondria, our favorite thing. That's why fevers can really take it out of you. So again, finding what fevers were was actually a very late advance in immunology, kind of funny. So lymph networks are what kind of help. They help transport these signals, they help transport cells to go kill stuff. Now it's a dangerous game that lymph plays though, because like I said, if there is any sort of bacteria or any sort of pathogen that gets into the blood, there are very few defenses that are actually in your red blood in a lot of cases. It, will, it could go undetected. One bacterial cell can replicate enough to start causing problems, right? Very hard to eliminate once they're in an artery or actually in your system. That is the word that you start to hear about sepsis. That's when people get put on massive antibiotics, things like that, but it's typically not a very good help. So the system is fast, but it's also a big highway for pathogen that can get in. Sort of a trade in that, in that sense. Okay, lymph nodes are just in blue text because, again, the actual raw anatomy of each lymph node is something that I think we'll cover a little later. But these are not your spleen or your thymus. These are just little pockets in the lymph that are sort of like, kind of like military bases, basically, that people can bring pathogen to, you know, the immune cells can bring pathogen to and kind of rally around. There's ins, there's outs. A lot of the times you'll have advanced stuff like B cells, you'll have T cell zones. You still 
still have quite a bit of your innate stuff here as well. So these little bases are good to kind of have that anatomy. Typically what you'll have is you have a site of infection right here. There's several ways to transport things back into the lymph more in a regulated way. There are a lot of borders between actual red blood and your lymph that are highly regulated what can go through. Like I said, if that gets in here, most patients are chosen in that case. Okay. So this is a good question for food is a foreign substance, right? Why doesn't the immune system go nuts? It's the first kind of innate specific side of things where your innate immune system in your gut is quite a bit different than the rest of your body. These villi right here kind of detect or grab food, they break it down. Nothing is allowed in except principal components, basically. And what I mean by that is that, I know this is in red text, but I think, yeah, I should probably emphasize that. It's just that you have a unique, you have a unique set of systems in your intestines. Ah. What I mean is that luckily, the system that you have in your immune cells with the intestine, they're a little more relaxed than others. And that, that does seem strange given that you're ingesting a lot of bad stuff all the time. Typically, anything that gets into your stomach that is trying to live in that acidic environment is not going to make you usually. So, typically, these are going to be broken down into really small components that are too small to ever trigger the immune system. But if your barrier of your lamina, your intestine, is broken by any means, <coughs> sometimes larger pieces, and we're going to use gluten in this case as the example, sometimes larger pieces will make it through. If they do, they will be treated like pathogen. And everybody goes nuts, everybody inflames, diarrhea, the whole bad stuff. It's every well, I'm not going to make you raise your hand. Who's ever eaten, obviously, think to yourself something that's like, wow, I feel terrible now. <coughs> or if you're allergic to something specific. So what happens is that if a piece of food that is too large does get through, your cells a lot of the time, unfortunately, will trigger that response. Unfortunately, as well, it's a lot of those parasite hunter cells that no longer have a role. They're still looking for eukaryotic cells. Most of the food you're eating is eukaryotic looking, right? Plants, animals, right? You can trigger a bad response. This is why a lot of the time, and we'll get into memory later, eventually that response never goes away. So, I know everybody goes crazy with practice questions, and I'm still kind of working on how I'm gonna do it, but <laughs> longer answer stuff is always easier to write, harder to grade. My multiple choices, and some of you guys to know, those are harder to write, obviously kind of easier to grade, but you do have to really like fine tune those to be fair. So as far as practice goes, this is kind of a, an example of sort of a, using what you know, and like given that you would have all your notes, and on the test you would have the double-sided sheet of paper, what are four components, maybe four tests, maybe four things you could do to say, okay, certain, certain cells acting up in this patient. You don't know what, or a certain cell, a certain component of the innate immune system is acting up. How would you be able to differentiate what part of the innate immune system would be acting up? You don't, and feel free to like kind of be creative with these answers. This is our first kind of look into this. So what kind of questions would you ask how could you basically eliminate certain things from the innate system? In this case, I'll just tell you, it's not skin. I'll just give you that one, that's too easy. Thinking past that, we'll go. So take a bit, think of some answers you would try and put on here. And again, this is kind of practice for that reason, for this type of question. Um, what is that gonna, we'll kind of, and like, I'll be here live in a sec, we'll kind of evaluate what I'm looking for in this case, this type of question. And again, in a real test, 
sketching things really does make my job pretty easy as well. So don't be afraid to rely on if you test this and this isn't there, perfect. You know it's not this, right? Try and play a bit of a game of elimination with the components we've seen. How are they different? And eventually, what could you test to like kind of figure that out? Using the similarities and differences that we've seen in some of these cells. And you don't have to like say what you don't have to run an ELISA or anything. You say, if we saw this, we know it must be one of these cells, right? Things like that, that type of thing. All right, once you have at least your top, like, there's a good way to differentiate if this is complement, let's say, or is this an NK cell? This could be any component that you would like to differentiate. Kind of see who to your left and right, what reasons they have, or what tests they would use to differentiate as well. See what you have in common, see what you could incorporate to something on your answer. differentiate which one it's responding to, that can eliminate a lot of uncertainty, right? So yeah, the question format itself is pretty like a little open because I'm going to design these questions. Sometimes they'll be more open like that, but sometimes I will give you a list of things that have happened and you will have to make the call. So this is that other way of doing that. I like that. Is this to present? That would be an easy like done. At least that would say maybe this is basically getting recruited in eosinophil or it's the mast cell. Microbes. Maybe like microbial. Don't all say histamine. Yeah, is there inflammation? Is there fever? That would tell you two different things. 
stop saying it's me. Oh, that's a recycle. It's okay. It's nothing like in 211. The last time we did this or something, it was like, yeah, my attempt can tell you something too. That's good. Our, isn't our neutral fills taking any action? That's fair too, I'd say. So see, it is a little general, but that's why this is a practice question and not like one of my reels. Good job, there you go. You would have to at least see if it's complement too, right? You have to see if it's cellular, right? That was good. Cell activation signals with those signals we saw, perfect. You can test for those genes, see if they're on. Okay, appearance of granules, perfect. The poisons are different across the cells, good job. It's okay, if you see, yeah, if you see your answer kind of show up before you got in there, it's okay, it happens. Now, if you're at the point where you're like, well, I don't have any answers, just say, I, I like one of these components the best, and that's okay. And remember, see, there's no names on here, you'll be all right. And this is also a test to make sure that the little pull everywhere works, because you guys know that I love to do this and torture the class, right? 211 during COVID, during flexing time, that was really when the pull everywhere were like, that was like everybody's like priority, right? When everybody was on Zoom and it was like, oh my God, he's got the pull everywhere, hurry, go. I heard stories from some students that they would go to the bathroom and be like, he doesn't pull everywhere, let me know. So I'll have to go back. Not a, yeah, that's a okay. bad. Graham's staying nice. Yeah, you can see like what kind of bacteria and then there would be a different like activation. Yeah, it's good. Sweet. And so when you see some of these general things, as we'll go through the class, we'll be able to tell specific pieces about what that means. Specific pieces, yeah, like about how that reaction will look. Because the typical way that I will test this can be, yeah. it can be open like this. You guys have seen the kind of questions that I kind of show with those multiple choices where it's not your typical multiple choice, it's not a fill in the blank. It'll be like, okay, it does this, it does this, you tested for this, it wasn't there, you tested for this, it wasn't there, you tested for this, right? So all this information will go basically into what is the right answer in that case. Now, like any clinical setting, you will be given more information than you need. Some pieces of information to the patient are more important than the other pieces, right? I think the example I always show is the patient walks in and they're like heaving all the time. Oh my God, like their lungs aren't working, blah, blah, blah. You do all these tests, you run all these numbers, you check their blood. Oh, but they're a smoker too. That, that probably would have solved a lot of the stuff, right? You get a lot of vital signs when really probably all you needed was patient history on some stuff. So sometimes the components that I give you, there will be one that is far more powerful than the others. Sometimes there'll be info that's interesting but maybe spurious to what we need in that moment okay so i think that's a decent intro to uh the innate i think it's pretty good i'll say the last three minutes um if you want to talk about your little writing and what i'm after bring that to me otherwise i think we're good for the day <laughs>